About 65 million years ago, some members of the class Mammalia, a subclass of the vertebrates in the animal kingdom, gave rise to certain primates. Over millions of years, this order evolved into various families, genera, and species, much like branches of a tree. Approximately 6 million years ago, the last common ancestor of a solitary primate gave birth to two daughters. One became the ancestor of all chimpanzees, while the other became our great-grandmother. Our paths diverged. The term human does not exclusively represent modern humans, homo sapiens, as commonly believed. Even just 100,000 years ago, Earth hosted at least six different human species. However, we are the only remaining representatives of a human species today. Now, let me take you on a journey two million years back in time. We are in East Africa, observing very familiar human characters, children and worried mothers, kids playing in the mud, elders seeking comfort, and rebellious youth challenging societal norms. These prehistoric humans fell in love, formed close friendships, and struggled for power and status, just like chimpanzees, baboons, and characters in movies. There was nothing particularly exceptional about humans. No one could have imagined that their descendants would one day walk on the moon, unlock the secrets of the atom, and write history books. Prehistoric humans were ordinary creatures, exerting less influence on their surroundings than gorillas, fireflies, or jellyfish. So, what happened? How did Homo sapiens, the only species to break free and become the master of the world, survive and thrive? We will delve into that in upcoming videos. For now, let's take a closer look at the evolutionary story of the human species. These humans first evolved about 2.5 million years ago in East Africa from a primate genus called Australopithecus. Around 2 million years ago, some of these early males and females left their ancestral homeland and migrated to various places in North Africa, Europe, and Asia. Survival in the snowy forests of Northern Europe required different traits than the humid creatures of Indonesia, leading human communities to evolve in different directions. This evolution resulted in the emergence of numerous different species, each given a grand Latin name by scientists. People in Europe and Western Asia were mainly members of the species Homo neanderthalensis, commonly known as Neanderthals. Neanderthals, in their evolution, were stronger and more muscular than Homo sapiens, and they successfully faced the challenges of the Ice Age in Western Eurasia. In the eastern regions of Asia, they were represented by Homo erectus, meaning upright man. This species thrived for nearly two million years in the region, setting a record. On the island of Java in Indonesia, Homo soloensis, meaning Java's man, lived. This species was adapted to tropical life. In Flores, another Indonesian island, humans underwent a process of beautification. The Flores man overcame obstacles where sea levels were exceptionally low. However, when the seas rose, some people were stranded on the islands. These individuals, with their smaller stature, managed to survive. Known as Homo floriensis, this species is unique, reaching a height of about 1 meter and weighing no more than 25 kilograms. In 2010, scientists discovered a fossilized finger bone while excavating Denisova Cave in Siberia. Genetic analysis proved that the finger belonged to a previously unknown human species, named Denisovan. Who knows how many of our lost relatives await discovery in other caves, islands, and different climates. While evolution took place in Europe and Asia, it did not halt in East Africa. Humanity continued to host various species, such as Homo denisova, meaning the tolerant human, Homo ergaster, the industrious human, and Homo sapiens, the humble behaving human. Some of these species were giant, some were formidable hunters, some were harmless gatherers, some lived in communities, and many explored continents. However, all belonged to the genus Homo, they were all humans. Let's clarify a misconception that many people have, all these human species did not follow a straight line, one succeeding the other in a linear fashion. In other words, 
all the preceding species were not prototypes of us. Indeed, from around 2 million years ago to 40,000 years ago, the world hosted many human species simultaneously, contrary to what many people assume. However, everything is fine up to this point. How do we know all this story as if we haven't experienced it on airplanes? Yes, some parts of the story are missing, but each piece of this puzzle has been discovered by anthropologists. We rely on fossils, radiometric dating performed on these fossils, and genetic analyses. Initially, a researcher named Morris Gunn, in 1963, compared the proteins of gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, and humans using immunological methods, proving that the primates closest to humans are gorillas and chimpanzees in the African river areas. Much has changed since then, and today, as we trace the origins and traces of human evolution backward, we leverage DNA polymorphism. For example, we know very well today that the genetic difference between chimpanzees and humans is surprisingly small. A chimpanzee is, on any given day, 90-8.70-7% identical to you. While the evolution of these two humans, like in all living beings, is a highly branched and complex process, if we wanted to look at it with a chronological order, which species would we encounter? The first representatives of our family were humanoids who had adapted effectively to the forested areas in the east and northeast of Africa. Humanoids, called Australopithecus, lived in the east and south of Africa from four and a half million years ago to a million years ago. These first representatives, whether frequently in savannas or dense forests, always lived by the water. Three features symbolized Australopithecus, a small brain, a large jaw, and the ability to walk on two feet. They hunted in a simple way, eating the small animals they killed without knowing how to use fire. While continuing to use trees as a shelter to protect themselves from dangerous animals in the distant surroundings and to sleep safely, they also began to stand on two feet. In this way, they gained a relative superiority over all living things around them, the field of vision of a standing human widened, and they could see their enemies more easily. With hands free, they could make and use tools, easily carry the small animals they caught, and collect plants. In addition, the body of a creature standing upright was less exposed to the scorching and straight sunlight of Africa, thus, the evaporation process of water in the body became more effective. Hands could do more things because their owners became more successful. Therefore, evolutionary pressure provided a denser nerve network and the development of muscles in the palms and fingers. Today, thanks to this, humans can do much more with their hands, especially produce and use complex tools. The ability to stand on two feet was, of course, not something that happened immediately. However, due to all these benefits, individuals who managed to stay on two feet gained an advantage and could survive, passing on their genes to the next generations. So, was there no disadvantage to walking on two feet? Of course, there was. Humanity paid the price for a wide field of view and skillful hands with backaches and neck strains. Women had to pay even more, an upright posture meant narrower hips, which narrowed the birth canal. Moreover, at the same time, the brains of babies were growing larger. Death at childbirth became a serious problem for female humans. However, since the heads and brains of babies were smaller, women who gave birth prematurely survived more and had more children. Natural selection gave a chance for early childbirth in this way. Thus, in comparison to other animals, humans became early born while many vital systems were not yet fully developed. A kitten can be left alone by its mother in search of food when it is only a few weeks old, but human babies are dependent on adults for assistance, intellect, protection, and education for years. This situation significantly contributed to the extraordinary social skills of humanity. Single mothers had great difficulty searching for food with their dependent children on their skirts. Raising a child required constant help from other family members and neighbors. Therefore, raising a human required the entire tribe. 
Evolution thus supported those who could establish strong social bonds. In addition, humans are born underdeveloped compared to other animals and are more trainable and capable of forming more social relationships than all other animals. Many mammals come out of the womb like a clay pot from the oven, trying to reshape them would harm them. Humans, on the other hand, come out of the womb like molten glass from a furnace and can be surprisingly shaped. That's why today we can educate our children as Muslims, capitalists, socialists, warriors, or peacemakers. We've extensively discussed the importance of standing on two feet. Now, let's move on to the second significant development in the humanization process, the unique development in the brain cortex. In the first representatives of our family, the brain was not much different from that of large primates. The smallest brain volume identified in Australopithecus was 400 cubic centimeters however, with the upright posture, the relationship between the head and body moved to a new position. These humanoids intensified the use of new behavioral patterns, and as tools gradually replaced the natural organs in their daily lives, these tools lightened the body's burden. These tools, which ranged from defense to education, and from money to neurons, directed energy. When it came to the developing brain, it closed to new ways of life, creating a kind of cause and effect relationship. Taking its place on the historical stage as the animal with the largest brain in proportion to the human body, it surpassed humans, it's time to meet the first ancestor of modern humans. Here is Homo habilis. Scientists believe that Homo habilis has a direct connection in the evolutionary tree of modern humans. The first examples of the Homo genus lived one. Eight million years ago in the well-shaded valley of Tanzania, East Africa. In excavations conducted in this region between 1959 and 1987, many representatives of Homo habilis were found. The facial and brain shapes in our habilis ancestors were particularly reminiscent of modern humans rather than humans. The cranial bones were more clearly defined, the brain in the frontal lobe region was more advanced than that of humans, and the skull had a more rounded appearance, free from all muscle connections. There were no strong chewing muscles and large molars, as in humans. The tooth enamel was thin, the canine tooth moved in line with the other neighboring teeth, and the large molars were less developed in relation to their lengths. The skeletal structure of the foot, the best evidence of upright posture, resembles modern humans both in transverse and longitudinal curves. However, looking at the leg muscles, we can say that they were more durable than us. The average brain volume of Homo habilis was 660 cubic centimeters in the first representatives of our genus, the brain was not only different from humans in terms of volume but also structurally different. For example, the presence of the Broca area indicates that our first ancestors may have had the ability to speak. Broca, located on the left side of the central brain, near the forehead, had a small protrusion and was associated with the language of speech. It also had a center responsible for the production of sounds. Homo habilis used stone tools to obtain sharp-edged axes, to tan animal skins, to tear off pieces, or to extract bone marrow. They also used these stone tools to shape pointed sticks for spears. Meat was not the only source of food, while females generally took on the task of gathering plant foods, males were engaged in hunting. Our first ancestors acquired the ability to transfer learned skills and technology to the next generation. This paved the way for the cognitive revolution. Cultural relationships encouraged brain development and formed a complex structure. This process allowed the freedom of the hand in Australia and enabled our habilis ancestors not to discard the tools they made once but to carry them to new camp areas. This paved the way for the cultural revolution. Now, it's time for Homo erectus. Known as the closest ancestor of Homo sapiens, Homo erectus had a larger and more advanced brain with an average brain capacity of 900 cubic centimeters the first representatives appeared about 1.9 million years ago, and the last representatives lived 117,000 years ago. The skeleton called the Turkana boy, found in 1984 in Kenya, 
is one of the skeletons of Homo erectus. The skeleton of this child, aged 10 to 11, was very well preserved, including the skull and lower jaw. Erectus successfully lived in every climate and geography, including Africa, Europe, the Middle East, Turkey, the Caucasus, and North and South Asia. A pelvic bone was found that indicated this species had the anatomy to give birth to large-brained babies. Homo erectus was the first species that could not only use but also produce tools. Moreover, they tamed fire, that is, they controlled and started to use fire. The oldest examples of controlled fire in South Africa show that Homo erectus tamed and started using fire. Absolutely, it's fascinating, isn't it? The taming of fire by Homo erectus completely transformed the way humans lived. Fire not only enhanced the taste of meats but also lightened the load on chewing muscles and the digestive system. This led to a reduction in jaw size, a decrease in teeth, and the redirection of energy towards the developing brain. A large brain meant increased cognitive capacity and intelligence. The discovery of fire significantly influenced the social aspects of humans as well. Gathering around the fire during the night and in cold weather provided humans with the opportunity to communicate more effectively. Perhaps they danced and sang around the fire, organized various ceremonies. Fire accelerated the psychosocial development of humans. Thus, in the transition from Homo erectus to sapiens, the threshold of the cognitive revolution was reached. Homo sapiens, both culturally and cognitively advanced, replaced Homo erectus. There was no discontinuity in this transition, and it was challenging to distinguish the first representatives of Homo sapiens from the last representatives of Homo erectus. The search for food, the development of better tools for a better life, the determination of effective weapons and strategies for efficient hunting, challenging living conditions such as adverse climate, allowed new human communities to spread all over the world. The process of natural selection favored the Homo sapiens species with the most capable, adaptable, cunning, resilient, and advanced communication system, as well as a large brain. This process marked the beginning of Homo sapiens dominance over the world. It was the start of a journey filled with religions, cultures, nations, civilizations, empires, and narratives. As Neanderthals and other life forms disappeared, the doors to an incredible adventure opened for Homo sapiens.